Hello, this is Kerry Shoots with MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show how to apply the LMS algorithm to the problem of system identification. And this is part one in a video series, and I'm calling this one our quick start approach. All right, let's go ahead and jump over into the tools. Okay, over in MATLAB, we have opened up a model called LMS SysID Quick Start, and that's this model right here. Uh, before we go and run it, let's go ahead and take a walkthrough of it to see um, how it works. Um, the good news is it's a very simple model. Uh, setting up Simulink to do system identification is a relatively straightforward task. I'll start with the system we're trying to identify. That would be a subsystem called unknown system. If I double click on that and drill into it, we're going to see we've got two candidate subsystems uh, inside of it, two transfer functions actually. Uh, one described by an FIR filter, a three tap FIR filter with coefficients 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and 0.2. That's the currently active one. And then later, we're going to throw a more challenging design at our LMS-based system identification algorithm, and that is an elliptic uh, IIR filter. OK, so that's our unknown system. Uh, we are exciting that with a Gaussian noise source. Uh, this one is set up to be zero mean unit variance and a sample rate of 1 kilohertz. And then what we are doing is taking the input and the output of our unknown system. And those serve as the two inputs to our LMS filter, which is going to be, again, our system identification block. Uh, this block, if we double click on it, uh, is a, again, mask subsystem uh, library component from the DSP system toolbox. And we have access to a number of different uh, knobs on the LMS algorithm. We can uh, set or select the algorithmic variant, the LMS algorithmic variant. I'm using the classic or the standard one. Uh, there are, of course, the other choices like signed error and signed data you could use as well. Uh, you can set the order or the filter length inside of this filter. It's currently set to 30. Uh, I'm going to lower that since right now I'm using a lower order FIR filter for the unknown system. Uh, so we're going to change that later. Uh, down to just three. Currently, we got the step size new set to 0.01. Uh, again, the best practice is usually you want to start maybe with a smaller value there as opposed to larger. Uh, it'll converge slower, but you can avoid uh, stability issues. If you set a too large value, you can end up with a case where the weights diverge instead of converge. Okay, I'm going to use this M script right here uh, to control or set. Let's see, it's delay link. I'm going to set it here yeah, to three. I'll run this. Now, when we go over here to the model and look at the value of the delay length, it's picking up this MATLAB variable I just set in the base workspace called delay length, which again, I changed it to three. And now that's reflected in the dialog of the LMS filter. OK, everything else in the model is pretty much just test bench uh, boilerplate. Uh, I've got a number of scopes and visualization um, devices. I've got a scope on the air. I have a scope on the weights, so we can see how those evolve over time. And then I'm also looking at the weights a couple different ways. I'm looking at them as a numerical list and also as just a snapshot view. Um, the other thing which is probably important to just at least give honorable mention to is just somewhat about how this LMS filter works. Underneath the hood of this, although we're not seeing the code, the implementation here in code or block diagram form, um, we we can um, we know that it's an FIR filter under the hood, which is used, being used in this case to estimate another FIR filter, the, the, the unknown system. Now, the weights on that FIR filter under the LMS, of course, are adapting. And they're adapting in response to um, an, an error signal, which is being computed which is the difference between the uh, output of the unknown system and the output of our adaptive filter running inside of the LMS filter block. That, the output of that filter I'm calling here D uh, estimate uh, versus the actual output D. So we're going to take the difference between those two, D minus D estimate, uh, multiply that by our step size times a pipeline, our vector of our input samples X, and that's going to be the update or the correction uh, to the weights. So when we're going to do this with for each and every input sample, we're going to be updating the weights accordingly, hopefully converging on an impulse response um, from the LMS filter uh, 
that mimics um, th that that forces the D estimate to closely approximate uh, the output of the unknown system D. So that's sort of the goal of the entire exercise. So let's go ahead and run this model and see how it performs. I'm going to go up here, hit the play button, and we will just sit back and see what happens. Okay, I got an error right off the bat. Let's see what I can do to fix that. Oh, I do have my stop set, stop time set. Okay, let's just set it for one second. And we'll run this there for 4,000 samples since my sample rate is 1,000 hertz. All right, and what we see immediately are all of our visualizations. Uh, we've got our air signal starts out large and then slowly decays to zero, which is a good thing. So that means D estimate is converging upon D. Uh, you see my uh, estimated weights. I got two of them that looks like are converging on 0.2. That would be good. And one of them going to 0.6, that's the middle tap. Likewise, over in the array plot viewpoint, we can see the snapshot of the weights here at steady state, 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and 0.2, also uh, in agreement with what we see on our weight scope. So all is good so far. But let's throw a more challenging problem at this uh, LMS filter, this system identifier. Let's go ahead and switch it uh, to our, um, our IAR filter. If we want to look under the hood of this block, it's going to show us how this filter was designed. And it was designed as an elliptic IAR low pass filter of order four, with a sample rate based on a sample rate of 1,000 and a pass band of 200 hertz, with a stop a pass band ripple of 1 dB and an attenuation in the um, stop band of 20 dB. And you can see its impulse response up here. You can see it's quite long, it's far longer than three taps. And if we want to look at its magnitude response, we can also select a number of optional analyses. So, so this is a very powerful block. It allows us to design a digital filter. It allows us to analyze the performance of said digital filter a number of different ways. And it also allows us to build or implement that filter in line in a simulate model. All right, so let's run this again. Uh, however, if we, if we leave it at three taps, like what we have it now, what we're going to find is it performs rather poorly. Um, just for fun, I'll just run it um, there anyway the first time. And again, we'll see it's a pretty noisy estimate, not nothing very solid there. Not, not, not to be surprised since, again, there's a lot more um, tap energy beyond three taps that we're not accounting for. All right, so let's go ahead and update our M file, which updates our model, and I'll go to 30 taps like I had it initially. Uh, we could run that. My model actually picks up the script, so I don't need to run it. It's going to run it as a init function callback. Uh, go ahead and run this model again, and we'll see what happens. And there it goes. And it looks like, again, much better now. You can see the array plot here. We can see the characteristic shape of the impulse response, making intuitive sense. We see the air decreasing over time, as we'd hope. And we see the taps, again, settling down to a more of a steady state value as opposed to a very noisy um, and steady state, okay, as before. So we're doing much better. Of course, we could increase the number of taps and, you know, get a better estimate uh, even up, over and above this. But, of course, at some point, um, just based on your implementation and resources constraints, uh, you'll probably limit it to, you know, some reasonable number. Okay, so that's most of what I wanted to cover from a modeling simulation perspective. Um, just some uh, closing comments really on this model. Uh, one is um, it's very easy to perform system identification in Simulink uh, with the LMS filter block. Um, it's really a matter of exciting your unknown system um, and then putting the excitation and the response to the system into the LMS filter block, picking a few carefully chosen parameters, running that model, and then looking at the impulse response that comes out. And notice, even for um, a system that's not FIR in nature, uh, like the underlying implementation of the LMS, again, there's an L FIR filter running in turn internal to this block. Uh, even if the system is IR in nature, it can do a reasonable job of estimating it if you give it enough taps to do so. But using the canned LMS block really is only a start. It's a great sort of rapid prototyping approach to see if your um, system, if, if an LMS-based approach is going to be feasible for whatever device under test you have. 
now so it's it's a great start it's you know it's parameterized nicely you can set a bunch of options it works right out of the box it's been very thoroughly tested uh, but on the downside you know again you can't see the implementation under the hood therefore you can't modify the implementation you can't log internal nodes and you can't set breakpoints like you might want to if you were developing your own um, lms based system id approach um, so in future videos, I want to address that. I want to show you how you can architect your own LMS algorithm from scratch um, and do all of these things above, debug, log, modify. Um, how you can compare different implementation variants of the LMS system approach. You might have a MATLAB version, a Simulink version, or different Simulink versions. And most importantly, how you can solve different problems with the LMS algorithm beyond system identification, problems like adaptive equalization. All right, that's enough for this time around. Thank you for tuning in. I hope to see you again. Thank you. All right, one sort of um, tack on PS comment I wanted to make to this uh, video was it might occur to some of you that, um, hey, if I just want the impulse response of my unknown system, instead of applying a random source, why didn't you just apply uh, an impulse and be done with it? Therefore, the response is the impulse response. As we all learned in school, we could just say, instead of this, Let's just do this. This is an, an impulse uh, and, and we're good now, right? Um, and that's true. In theory, you can do that. Uh, in practice, however, what you'll find in the real world is that you, a lot of times you don't have access to the input of the system. So you can't apply uh, such thing as like an impulse or a discrete impulse. And or if you did apply an impulse, it could do damage to the system, depending on what kind of, you know, maybe electrical, electromechanical system you had. So maybe... Uh, it would go nonlinear, or in order to get enough energy out of such a system, you had to drive it with a very large short impulse, and that would have deleterious side effects on your unknown system or your you know device under test. So in many cases, in the real practical world, you just don't have the luxury of applying a discrete impulse. Therefore, you've got to go with some broadband source, maybe the actual whatever uh, kind of signal the system is seen in practice. And so you've just got to, shall we say, roll with that as opposed to uh, applying some theoretical uh, discrete impulse as the excitation. All right. Thank you again. I just wanted to get that one last comment in there. Thank you.